Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Hello there, and welcome back to Plain Spoken. I'm your host, Derek Fournier, and I'm excited to bring you another podcast, continuing with my accountability series on this every other week release cycle. And this week, we're talking about navigating business transformations. Uh, We released a blog on Wednesday talking about that, and that's sort of the cadence we're trying to maintain, where we release a blog that introduces the topic, then I come back uh, on the podcast that week and try and get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty, maybe some firsthand experience. And we will be continuing, if you recall from our inception, our interview series as we continue to get some hosts lined up. Uh, We've also upgraded the video. Hopefully, for those of you who watch this on YouTube, that's made your experience better. Uh, But this is all a work in progress, and and it's really something we're enjoying. Uh, If you have interest in participating, we'd love to hear from you. So drop me a line at derek.fournier at plain-site.net. Boy, that's a mouthful. I'll come up with an easier way for you to communicate or even, you know, send comments back through our website or through LinkedIn. But today we're talking about business transformations. And I wanna start that conversation out by kind of characterizing what some of the business transformations are that we think about. A lot of times in my experience and the people that I've worked with, they've been digital. Uh, and sometimes that's a, a common way to think about uh, business transformations because the, the most disruptive transformations that are sort of top of mind become digital, whether it's the implementation of a new software system, platform, et cetera. And fundamentally, those change how business operates. I've been involved in countless digital business transformations, and there are some similarities between the digital side of the world and some of the other ones that we'll get into. But I'm sure that I will riff, as I often do, on these sorts of of topics. Another one's around automation, and automation should be top of mind because when you think about artificial intelligence, this is just another kind or evolution of automation. Anytime we're using technology, to make tasks that were done by hand or manually previously done by some sort of an automated fashion, it's going to cause a tremendous transformation. Uh, Ideally, it will drive efficiency, reduce costs, uh, increase consistency. But like everything, there's two sides to the coin that also tends to lead towards a reduction in necessary uh, labor or personnel. Now, One of the common refrains on both of these uh, pieces on the technical side around digital transformation is that with the advancements on a technical or digital front, the intention is not to go out there and reduce headcount. Now, from a business perspective, reduction of cost is generally a good thing, but it isn't what you should be thinking about first and foremost, generally speaking. What we often have discussed is with automation or digital transformation, what we're doing is trying to free up these smart folks that we have accumulated that are part of our team that create the very culture that we have helped create to do more high value opportunities, to do more high value work. In many cases, in the first bucket, they were the ones that developed the last way we did this set of tasks, whether in, in our previous world for crews, whether it was the way we handled embarkation, which software products we sort of stitched together, what were the actual process flows and people flows that we leveraged. Um, or if it was an automation perspective, you know, if we've implemented uh, an automated CI/CD process, how can we take those tremendous resources that know so much about our business and free them up to go do the next great sort of uh, revolutionary step forward rather than continue to, to chip away at the evolutionary steps forward that these two pieces typically represent? Now, on the business-centric side, sometimes we talk about market dynamics and financial ones. This is around consumer behavior, uh, trying to compete in your landscape, whether that is changing your marketing approach, who your target demographics are. But the really disruptive ones on this slide that you have here, and for those of you who are not uh, watching this on YouTube, but listening on the the podcast, 
Um, there are slides that go along with these podcasts, and you can get those on our on our video version. And all these are linked on our website at plain-site.net. But the financial or structural pieces are mergers and acquisitions, uh, leadership changes or organizational shifts, or regulatory changes. Now, I haven't done a tremendous amount around regulatory changes, so I'm going to steer clear of that and leave that to experts in that space. But with mergers and acquisitions on the technical side, you end up blending those together. It's very easy to think about that. If you imagine uh, in a merger acquisition scenario, two companies that do something similar, but use totally different infrastructures to accomplish that. You know, the easy one is email. They used to be very common. Now email is sort of generalized around a couple of primary uh, providers. But when you're trying to streamline and drive efficiencies and continuity, having to combine both the merger and acquisition organizational pieces with regards to leadership, management, communication, collaboration, and the tools with which those things are accomplished, like email, uh, platforms like SharePoint or other uh, equivalent portals, uh, you end up with a big pile that has to be managed. And this is one that's usually top of mind for folks. And so with that as a backdrop, we're going to talk about some strategies you can use to address any of these kinds of transformations, whether they be technical, digital, market, financial. And I'll probably spend a lot of time on the leadership and organizational ones, but we're going to start out with step one, as we call out in this uh, series, which is to define a clear vision and strategy. Now, for those of you old heads out there like me, vision, mission, goals, all those sorts of things, um, they, they get attacked almost cyclically with by changing the name of them, going into different approaches to do them. At the end of the day, what you want to do is make it clear to everyone in the organization, and I'll use up and down, even though I don't really like that sort of nomenclature, even though it's very common, and it makes sense if you think about an organizational chart the way we've all used them, everyone needs to be singing from the same hymnal. I hope that that reference isn't lost on you. So it is critical, especially during times of transformation, that it is clear to everyone why the transformation was embarked on, what good looks like, what the goal is, what the benefits are. And if you can outline them in advance, you know, it's even better to, to identify roadblocks or uh, what we call them minefield documents, right? That will help ensure organizational alignment. It will keep everyone marching towards the same goals and singing from the same hymnals. So, by making sure that that vision and strategy is at the heart of everything you're doing around whatever the transformation is, you can work on a roadmap that calls out the, the targets you're going after, as well as the, the known dangers that you may encounter so that you can do some adaptation along the way. And we'll talk about that in a further uh, slide and in a further piece of how to handle transformations. But the last point here that I wanna make sure we talk about is uh, the phrase motivation through clarity. It is very hard to row fast when you don't know where the hell you're rowing to. If you use the basic fundamentals of leadership during transformation, right? That's why this shouldn't be a shock to anyone, right? It's not actually unique to transformation unless you look at transformation at a micro level, which is every day you're doing some kind of transformation. It really only bubbles into a word like that when it becomes a big issue. And that's fine. That allows us to sort of earmark it and call it out. But if you are clear in that vision strategy, defining what good looks like, what the risks that you perceive are, and you do that with an overarching concept of trust and communication, which we've talked about ad nauseum in other podcasts and in our blog posts, that's going to drive morale and productivity because everyone is sharing the purpose. Everyone understands why we have embarked on this. Now, anecdotally, there are all sorts of scenarios where this has not been true, uh, where it's not been clearly articulated. But one of the ones that is a case study that everyone uses, and in researching for this show, while I wasn't involved in Netflix, everyone sort of knows what the heck Netflix did, right? They started out with their DVD rentals. We, you know, my family used to get the little red envelopes that would come in, and that's back in 1997, which was as my children said the other day, back in the 1900s, when they refer to my, uh, my early days, uh, that that's a bit of an overreach by them. But uh, but the point still lands. But around 2007, they pivoted to streaming, they saw the future, they knew the future wasn't DVDs. And they pivoted and started working on technical advancements that would allow them to become a leader 
in the space. And as I dug in some more things, I actually heard some of this on uh, Scott Galloway's uh, podcast. Uh, they had apparently reached out to Blockbuster and tried to partner with them uh, and got nowhere. Uh, but Netflix is still here. And in fact, Netflix is a giant now. Uh, and Blockbuster has but one store left. And that's actually a romantic story. I think you can actually watch the documentary on Netflix in an incredible stretch of irony. But the point is, they went into this with strategic planning, adaptability. They were clear about their vision and their strategy, and they moved forward towards that goal. Number two, and apologies to those of you watching the slides, I didn't realize that this would come across poorly in the slides, but the, uh, the color for these two pieces is, is not great. But number two is engaging your stakeholders. So when we talk about the vision, mission, strategy, goals, all those sorts of things, those are relatively obvious, right? Those are your team. And I said earlier that I talked top and, and or up and down. So if you're in the C-suite, you're talking to your leadership team, to the broader team, to the company writ large. You're also communicating up to your board. If you're a publicly traded company, you're doing probably some press work around there. But the important piece is to make sure you know who all the stakeholders are, both internal and external. And external can take sort of two different acts here in my mind, because you know boards may not think they're external, but in some ways they are. There's sort of an interesting little wall between the board and the organization. And I think effective companies manage that incredibly well and make that wall seem more like just a lanai door. You just walk through and it's very easy. But looking at your customers, your partners, your channel, the ecosystem in which you operate and engaging those stakeholders, not just engaging to tell them, don't talk at them, but share with them. In fact, when you're building your vision, your mission, your strategy, and all those pieces around the transformation that you're working on, by engaging your stakeholders early in so much as you can, right? And I say that because sometimes the changes are so transformative that that would be a bad idea from a market perspective. But if you can get them out there early and get them involved, then they feel like they were participatory in the development of the vision, mission, goal, strategy, et cetera. They are part and complicit in the communication, and they will develop a feeling of ownership in that process. And that is an incredibly powerful piece because one of the challenges with any of these transformations, and I'm trying to think of how to sort of, I'm not a politically correct person, so I can't even say that I'm trying to be politically correct. One of the biggest reasons transformations fall is internal, uh, internal, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Crap. It's not corruption. Um, it's not collusion. Whatever. Someone internal that doesn't want the damn thing to happen is what I'm trying to say. And apparently I have no vocabulary today as I'm recording this podcast. But when you have someone who is not committed to the direction and they're a naysayer, they are a detractor, that is one of the number one reasons for any transformation failure and for any failure in any organization. If you don't have people aligned, you will have problems because that means the call is coming from inside your own house, reference to a classic horror story there. So um, by making sure those folks are aligned and engaged, you increase the likelihood that everyone will be rowing in the same direction. Um, that is one of the most critical pieces you can do and something that should not be uh, overlooked. One of the examples that I'll use here is, uh, and I've talked about this on previous podcasts, so apologies if this sounds like rehash, but back when I was at Microsoft back in, well, it started in the 1900s, as my kids would say, but it was really early 2000s. We were releasing a product called Systems Management Server. It was a largely derided product, despite making uh, I don't know, $250 million and being very useful, uh, but it was not it was not a great product. The quality was not where it needed to be. We had an incredibly crap release for SMS 2.0. And then we followed up with an incredibly crap release of Service Pack 1 because we just couldn't do enough testing. It was an enterprise class product. And we didn't have, even with the massive test lab we had and the tremendous amount of test effort that went in, you couldn't get all the permutations of hardware and software to make sure that you weren't going to you know, screw things up royally. And so we screwed things up royally, not once, but twice. But in an effort to avoid screwing it up thrice for my people in India, shout out uh, Jaipur, uh, we, in a team that we call the enterprise team, were able to work with the leadership team and create an early adopter program. And, and the essence of this was to get customers of ours in the tent, bring them in, 
share with them our dreams, visions, aspirations of this transformative journey, which was our new release. Get them engaged in the communication. Get them bought in. It, it, take their feedback even. Maybe even listen to them. God forbid, right? We actually were able to convince them we created two tiers and some of this detail is unnecessary. But we were able to get some of them to allow us to deploy the product in their production environment before it was ready to release. That would be like deploying a beta, uh, which is what we used to call it before Agile, um, of product in production. It was, it was largely unheard of at that scale. But what it did was give us access to massive amounts of variants and hardware variants and software variants and configuration variants. It was incredible. And to be honest, I think it was the salvation of that product line, which has evolved into a multi-billion dollar product line, as I understand it. Now it's evolved immensely since I was engaged two decades ago. Um, but that, that concept of engaging your stakeholders and bringing them into the tent and working with them, getting that valuable feedback and working on smooth implementations is absolutely the heart of everything. And, and it, again, it transcends discrete transformations. You should always be listening to your stakeholders. If you don't know who the hell they are, you have made a mistake and you need to fix it. Number three, and to be honest, number three could be pervasive across the whole thing is about effective communication. In everything, we have to be clear. And so that is amplified, uh, enhanced, uh, more critical, much more important, or as we would say in Polk County, Florida, for those of you who understand that geographic reference, that you have to have clear communication. So when you have worked together with your stakeholders, crafted that vision, mission, goals, defined clearly what good looks like, given people understanding and context around the why of the transformation, right? Not just the we will do, but the we will do because. We are doing because this is critical, it is important, et cetera. You've got to manage expectations of that with regards to timeline, impact, all of those pieces. And you can, by communicating clearly, reduce uncertainty. And uncertainty leads to concern and confusion, and confusion leads to challenges, which we've talked about before. Now, by doing this clearly and effectively, that means using various platforms. You've got to go where people are. You've got to communicate where people consume. Uh, and you've got to implement, you know, interesting, you know, strategies to get that engagement because you can't, once again, just talk at people when you're doing these sorts of transformations. You have to speak and communicate with them because while you may have done a great job to engage stakeholders, there's always the possibility that you missed important stakeholders. We're going to hearken into that in a second. One of the things that, that I've used in, in my career are town hall meetings. Now, this was this was made easier, to be honest. I, I've worked remotely more or less since I left Redmond, Washington uh, in 2003, 2004. But with, with the advent of video conferencing and the absolute ubiquitous nature of high-speed internet connections, certainly within the U.S. infrastructure and, you know, my former company, we had offices in India. We had employees in, I think, four different countries we really never encountered a challenge with connectivity. And in fact, with Starlink, you've got the ability to have connectivity to be truly almost ubiquitous. Using video conferencing for town hall meetings is really important. We would use them all the time to get people together. Now, it is not a replacement for in-person. So, and we'll talk about this on a separate podcast probably. I'm not surprised that there's an urgency or a desire to get back into the office because being around three-dimensional physical human beings is in fact very powerful, useful, and good. Does that mean you should spend an inordinate amount of money to do it? No. Does it mean you should invest in incredibly high fixed costs to have a fancy building so that everyone can congregate and have coffee together? No. It means be smart about it. And when you can't do those things, like we couldn't as a multinational company, you use the tools you can. But town hall meetings structured well will allow you to create and engender trust and you can actually implement that clear communication. When we were doing a major transformation in our organizational structure in 2018 at my previous company, we were changing how engineering worked, we were changing everything up to and including the leadership level and bringing in new sales. The market was in a really tough spot. This was pre-COVID, we were operating within Cruise, we were releasing a new platform. There was a ton of uncertainty and we were had uncertainty in a market where at the time anyway, um, in the Indian uh, engineering market, 
people were always very concerned about whether or not they were going to have a job. Uh, there was a constant request for increases. It was a very different cultural model. And what we we're trying to do was morph this into something that was more cohesive. And so we chose to use town halls, both in person and remote. And we chose to use very direct communications. We we collaborated with everyone to make sure that we had clarity around our vision, mission, and goals. And then we went out and let people know that they were part of those things. And as long as they were aligned, as long as they believed what we believed, and we were all going for the same what good looked like, and if everyone was working in good faith, we had plenty of customers and we could go get more. And there would always be work to do. But we also were very clear in articulating that if for whatever reason, and not making a qualitative assessment here, mind you, we were not aligned in our vision, mission, and goals. We did not agree on what the core value proposition was of our company to our clients, or of our company to our employees, or of our employees to each other. Or if you just plain out didn't like working in the space, if there was any reason why you didn't feel like you were engaged as a stakeholder and wanted to remain, that was not an affront. That was not rude. That was simply true. It was a water is wet moment. And if, if I, as the CEO of the company at the time, and you as a leader at your organization, if you cannot create an environment where someone feels uh, valued, belonging, uh, high, value, high worth, uh, some level of joy in what they do, and they enjoy it, and, and they're able to excel and learn and do all these sorts of things, and they're constantly thinking about going somewhere else. If you can't change that for whatever reason, I feel you owe it to them to help them find some place where they can. And that's not rude and that's not a threat. Now, when I articulated it back in 2018, some people took it that way. And so I followed it up with an in-person visit to make sure they didn't. That wasn't a, hey, listen, if you don't like it here, I'll make sure you get out of here. That wasn't the message. The message was, if we can't make here the place that you want to be, then we owe it to each other to find you someplace where you can unlock your talents, right? That kind of communication. And I know I've gone a little far afield of transformation, but this is organizational transformation. That kind of honest, open feedback and discussion will lead to trust. And trust is the foundation of any organization worth a shit. You can peel back the layers of everything else, the veneers of the buildings, any of that stuff. I don't care what your ARR is. I don't care what your cash on cash is. I don't care about any of that. If your organization is not built on a foundation of trust, it will eventually fail. And so this clear communication piece is absolutely critical because it leads to alignment and belonging and value beyond the normal multiple. I apologize for my slight diatribe. Number four, flexible execution. So we talked about the importance, the criticality of the vision, mission, goals, the articulation, the engagement of your stakeholders. We talked about all that stuff, and it sounds like what we've done is we've taken these giant concrete slabs and we, you know, chipped it in there. And you know, I come down from the mountain with these ten commandments, and and that's not what it is. What you've done is you've you've created and articulated what you would like to do based on what you believe is going to happen. But where companies who really succeed in transformation of any type, be it digital or, or organizational or market transformation, is they are willing to be flexible in the execution. As you start down that path towards what good looks like and you run into unforeseen challenges, you have to be able to be flexible using the same fundamentals, the same blocking and tackling that you use to build the initial plan. Now, that doesn't mean chase every shiny penny, right? You still want to use that North Star about the reason behind the transformation, but you have got to make sure you don't go after that North Star with blinders on because the givens and assumptions and rules and structure that existed on day zero may be very, very different on day 180. And if you're not using your peripheral vision, you will get hit in the side of the head. So maintaining that equilibrium between plan adherence and adaptability is absolutely critical. So uh, this happens quite often in software. We, uh, we worked with a couple of partners during at my last company, and they were fantastic partners. They are fantastic partners. I, I still am close with, with both of these organizations. 
the first partner used a set of languages and had had worked on some of our modules for quite some time and and had made significant progress. Uh, the choices of those languages made sense when they made the choices, or at least it made sense not to argue with it at the time to make the progress that needed to be made. However, as we continued down the path towards release, we realized there were some scalability challenges with the platform that was chosen. We realized that there were potential security issues with the platform that was chosen. And in some ways, the most critical challenge was there was a staffing issue and that there wasn't enough talent that was capable in that platform to maintain the amount of work that needed to be done. And so we either had to just grin and bear it, or we had to make a really hard decision to essentially rewrite that entire module, and it was actually multiple modules, uh, in a more uh, pervasive uh, platform or language. If we had stuck with just our goal, which was a date-driven release of that module based on functions, et cetera, we could have certainly kept our blinders on and ignored the performance degradation under large load, which we weren't gonna encounter for quite some time, but we knew was, was down the road. Um, it would have been far less expensive to, to just stay the course rather than essentially throw away all of that work. Uh, it would have been less detrimental to the relationship because we ended up having to pivot away from one partner who was our primary to another partner. Uh, and that wasn't a slight. To the first partner. They've done incredible work and we built incredible relationships with them. They certainly understood the flow of all of these modules. It's just they had articulated them in a language that we could not move forward with. So our transition from that stack to another stack caused a cascading set of transformations that we had to go through. Um, we made it. We got through that. We maintained the relationships because we used clear communication. We were very direct. And had we not done it then, the cost would have been far greater down the road. These can be, these lessons can be learned in a digital sense, which is where I'm mildly biased because I've spent so much time there. They can be market biased. You can go after a certain demographic and find out that demographic doesn't give a crap about your product, right? I, and now I will riff here and hopefully this will hold up the analogy because I don't like doing post edit stuff. So at least you know that what I'm saying here is, is what I truly believe. Uh, as I understand it, when they were when they were doing the research for Viagra, it was a blood pressure medication, and they just found out that there were uh, uh, other side effects uh, around erectile dysfunction. Well, they pivoted. Great, so it's not a blood pressure medication. Now they've made tons of money on Viagra and the related medicines. Now that's a silly sort of tongue-in-cheek way to talk about it, but you have got to not put on blinders. I know that people talk about focus and dedication and drive and all those sorts of things and be laser-like. There's a time for laser and there's a time for flashlight. And you don't have to always have just one on. And with a leadership team that is all aware of what that North Star is, as I keep mixing my metaphors, if you're, if you're clear where the North Star is, it doesn't detract from the pursuit of the North Star to keep your damn eyes open. Last but not least on this topic is monitoring and evaluation. And this is where our data people are going to be very, very happy. Uh, you know the old saying, you can't improve what you don't measure. You've got to make sure that with that goal, with that transformation, you set up the criteria of what good looks like, not just in sort of aspirational terms. Subjective assessments are fine. They're useful. Context matters. I couldn't bang the table hard enough on the importance that I find in context as I feel that we have lost context in good faith as a culture now. But you need objective measures too. Now, you should be clear about which ones are important and in which sequence you will hold them. So if you have a objective measurement, and maybe it's a number of new clients, a number of deployments, a number of migrations, it could be a number of positions hired in a new, uh, in a new business unit, it could be uh, merger acquisition transitions to mailboxes, who knows, right? It, it could be any of these things. Creating those sort of key performance indicators or dashboards around objective measures is great. And you can create a red, yellow, green board. I'm a huge fan of a red, yellow, green board. Who isn't? Except for I saw one the other day that was red, yellow, light green, dark green. And I don't mean to cast aspersions, but damn, I don't like it, right? Three is good. Four doesn't make me happy. At any rate, the important piece is the comment field next to them. We determined that this would be green, and it's green. 
But if you have those blinders off and you see, well, it's green, the number's green, but I have a concern, right? Maybe that moves it to yellow. I don't know. Or conversely, this is red, but to be honest, what we found out was this KPI was crap. We shouldn't have used this KPI. Let's deprecate it and pull it off the list. That goes back to our communication. You see how all five of these are interrelated? By at least calling out what it is you're going to monitor and how you're going to evaluate and tethering that to that what good looks like aspirational vision and mission, you have a way to track progress across time. And you can make those changes if you're maintaining flexibility and say, oh, well, these KPIs made a lot of sense when we started, but we ended up pivoting a bit in the middle because of a market change or a leadership change or a competition change. And so now we're going to re we're going to recast them. If you are communicating well and you have built an organization that is founded in trust, none of this will cause a problem. Healthcare is notorious for doing these things, using data analytics to move things forward. Uh, energy companies do this a lot. Any company that uses a lot of data in their normal course of operations, and you could argue that financial data for any business is voluminous. So the CFOs out there, anyone in our uh, back office is saying, well, I got tons of KPIs I can use. And you can, right? Whether you're using balance sheet stuff, whether you're using income uh, or expense statement stuff, there are all kinds of metrics that can be used. And people who are part of your team can bring those pieces up. I want to use this as an objective measure, and this is why. And then collectively, you can build this together as your sort of scorecard um, and move that forward. If you don't have those data pieces, right, it becomes more complicated in some ways. And I'll use as an example for that organizational changes. When you're trying to maybe build out a new uh, business unit or refine the way like we did with engineering, change the way the management was done, you've got to come up with some different KPIs that are almost more subjective than objective because it can't just be about hiring. Now, when it comes to humans and word that I don't like or a phrase I don't like, which is human capital, one of the things that I always hammer on here is, is uh, and this is a bit of a tangent, so I apologize, is employee referrals. If you're doing something around change of organization and structure, what you really want to do to determine health of your organization, we used to have an organizational health index at Microsoft, which was a massive survey that seemed to do good things. It, it asked us if we were happy in a thousand different dimensions, and there are probably a million different versions of this. But I tend to be a pretty straightforward person. That's why my company is called Plain Sight. And if my people are recommending their family and friends to come work at this company, we're doing something right. Now that is objective because we can track how many employee referrals we get. If that number is not going up, then maybe we have an issue. Now we may not have any jobs, so you gotta, you gotta make sure you caveat it appropriately. Um, but the moral to my point here, the moral to my story is, the less data focused it is, the harder this one becomes. But if you just keep that balance on subjective and objective and maintain that, that clarity of communication, this will be part of your success model moving forward. So in a recap, we've got five things that we talked about, and I really tried to do a better job than I normally do of pulling them back in as we went through this session. But it starts with the clear vision and strategy. You've got to know what the North Star looks like. You've got to engage stakeholders as you're developing that to make sure that the North Star that has been chosen was not just chosen by you and or dictated by you, but rather was something that collaboratively was developed. Now, that does not mean you have to have a team meeting and everyone has to vote on every single thing. You cannot manage any organization of any size by consensus. And despite what people like about crowdsourcing things, that's not always the great answer either. But you do need to engage your stakeholders so they feel as though they were consulted. Now, we could go into racy charts and maybe we'll do that on another podcast. But making people feel participatory matters as long as it is authentic. You can't just ask their opinion and then disregard it unless you tell them why it was disregarded. And this goes into a concept we talked about, which is disagree and commit, which is a, a topic, again, for another podcast. Maintain effective communication. Everything I have said on every blog post and every podcast and every meeting room I've been in is about effective communication. And I promise you, with as much as I write and I talk, I have screwed this up more than you have. 
This is something you only get better at through practice and through feedback. Ask for feedback. Go actively engage to get feedback. Am I communicating clearly? Are we communicating clearly? Did this message come across? If you're not always sharpening that tool, I promise you it will be blunt. And that is not what you want. Number four, flexible execution. Don't have blinders on. You can have a North Star and not have to be laser focused. I don't care how much people like writing that on LinkedIn. You've got to have the ability to see left and right when you're moving forward. And if you want to have someone else in the team who's trusted to do that because you really do have to focus, maybe that's a way you can get through this. But by God, make sure your peripheral vision is consulted. Because if not, you will get your clock cleaned. And last but not least is monitoring and evaluation. Having a way that you can understand and clearly articulate things that are objective measures of success and or failure or less success. I don't care how soft or hard you are about that. And what the subjective assessment of those pieces will be and how you will weigh those becomes a very important piece. So how do you apply these to your business? Well, you really have to make sure that you encourage uh, conversation. Uh, I, I encourage you to use these tools to, to look at how you've done transfer, uh, uh, transformations in the past. Have you already done this? Are you already an expert at it? Uh, in my experience, most people are not. It doesn't make them stupid, bad, or lazy, or bad, stupid, or lazy, and talentism vernacular, right? It just means they haven't done it, or they haven't done it successfully, or they haven't done it su successfully enough. Um, I encourage you to use these strategies. Um, and, and I think that you'll, you'll have some benefit and I'd love to hear from you. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do is <clears throat> figure out how to get more engagement in, in this podcast and in our writing in general. So if something that I said today did not resonate, tell me I'm full of shit, right? <laughs> Let's get the conversation started. You can do it here on LinkedIn where we publish most of our stuff or on YouTube, or I assume in Spotify, uh, I'm going to work to have a better way for feedback but I would love to hear if these landed with you. And if you've used these, which ones have been successful, which ones you struggle with, what's the hardest challenge you face? Because only through collaboration, sharing, and exchange are we all going to get better at these things. So I thank you for listening to this podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please let us know. Share it with your friends. That will increase our reach, which would be great. If you think that Plain Sight can help you or your organization with any of these things that you're facing, please don't hesitate to reach out. We do this because we dig doing it. Right, I founded Plain Sight because I have a group of people that I love working with who I've been through the, the uh, business trenches with. And the reality is what we found out is the problems are interesting. They can be academically stimulating. They can be academically, intellectually challenging. But, but overcoming those things with people who you love, trust, and respect is what I really wanted to do in this next chapter. Now, whether that's with one company or with 20 companies is largely immaterial. We'll make sure that we scale to a level that is appropriate so that our clients get the best value they can and the best uh, consulting and advisory feedback that they can. But we will make sure that we are helping move the ball forward. So as always, thanks for listening. Do please share. Uh, and if you're out there reading the blog on plain-site.net, love to get your feedback on that. Connect on LinkedIn. And, uh, and we'll be back in two weeks with another topic. Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, the podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken.